Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome back to Sunless Skies. Uh, today we are starting our third and final Captain's Voyage. Uh, I guess final unless I get to the ambition screen and it turns out that something else crazy is happening. Uh, but I've kind of figured out a little bit about who this character is already. We obviously, we want to go after the truth ambition. So what I'm thinking is, this is someone who has read the Song of the Stars. Maybe they were not familiar with it uh, before, but they were on Sister Patel's crew, and I imagine she spoke very highly of it. I'm sure it wasn't, like, required reading or anything. But they read it, maybe they even read her copy of it. And they found the, the combination of, like, the wonder expressed in that thing, and the inspiration of Sister Patel's voyage brought something out in them. This is a person who wants to wants to resolve something about the universe, who wants to right some of the wrongs, who wants to make some of the struggles perhaps not so struggly. Basically, someone who wants to help people and thinks they have maybe a grand idea about how to do that. If only they can just figure out the, the details. So, I think this character is probably going to be... Uh, first of all, we know we want to focus hearts for, because we really haven't focused hearts yet, and also we have uh, definitely some equipment that incentivizes it. Uh, I don't think this person was a priest. It might be the case that um, that we don't start with high hearts. I think the person we're talking about here definitely has a little bit of a revolutionary bent. So maybe this is like... Hearts... Hearts, Veils, and Mirrors, with Iron being the stat that ends up being low, that's going to make some of our equipment not usable, in particular um, our extremely good plating. So our engine's going to be a little bit more fragile, but we should be really good at challenges. You know, this, uh, this is a person who hasn't had to, like, throw hands a lot in their life. This is not one of the crew that Sister Patel took with her during the Hour of Devils, right? This is somebody who stayed with the engine. The law offered you no protection. The engines of the state were set against that which you knew to be just. That sounds about right. And if you're thinking, hey, there are a lot of similarities between these three characters, yeah, that's definitely the case. So I'm imagining that, like, after Sister Patel became immortal, I think her crew knows what happened. Uh, I don't think she's made any big secret about it. So after she became immortal and there was a suitable time of rest and celebration, you know, there's probably, I imagine, a, uh, a pretty big party thrown. Uh, this is a person who, like, went to Sister Patel and was like, so we sort of have all of the power in the universe. Maybe we could use it for something. And I'm not going to try to fill in all the character details now. Part of what I really enjoy about playing Sunless Guys this way is getting to write the character in sort of all directions at once. But the kernel of this idea... The kernel of who this person is, is they wanted to take the accumulated power, all of the favors and bits of knowledge that they'd accumulated, and the fact that, uh, and of course the weapons, the big guns, and of course the fact that Sister Patel is uh, terrifyingly powerful and immortal, and use it to fix some of the things about the universe. And I think they made a they made a heartfelt pre uh, a heartfelt plea, high hearts, high veils. And Sister Patel was like, you know what? That's a that's a solid idea. I get where you're coming from. I'm just not interested. But I'm convinced enough that here's all the stuff. I'll go get a new engine. Obviously, shouldn't be any problem. Sister Patel is unbelievably rich now. But I bequeath the journey. I bequeath the song to you. And you go forth and take these things and do your best. And if you need me, I don't know. Ask it, ask it Langley Hall. They'll probably know where I am. So, with your feet and fists, not so much. With your mind, lies are the tools of tyrants. You pu publish research to expose those lies and illuminate injustice. Or with your art. Hmm. I think that these both sort of fit. We don't really, uh, we don't really know too much about who this person is yet. Like it's. It's a lot to have high hearts and also high mirrors and also high veils, and I'm not sure which of those things are the most important to us, but we know we're going to care about hearts. So yeah, this is a person with a with an artistic temperament, let's say. Art travels swiftly, it cannot be imprisoned, it cannot be hanged. Inspired as they were by the Song of the Sky, I think this makes sense. 
This is a demanding ambition. Even the stars have secrets, but they won't keep them from you. A message from an old friend begins an unwise quest to learn a secret that the stars hide. What drives you? Curiosity? Justice? Insolence? Probably a little bit of all three? Whatever it is, it will be tested. So I have no feelings at all on, uh, on this subject. I don't know anything about who this person is physically. Just randomize a little bit. Uh, I don't know, none of this is like jumping right out at me. The problem is there aren't really that many options and we already used a lot of the ones that I think are really cool looking. It's not really a captain's hat. All right, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get in here manually. Hmm, I think a hat says a lot about a person. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, but that would be less true if the contents of the book got to choose the cover, as is the case with a hat. Maybe this is like when I first saw this, I was like, it's a nun's habit. That's a little weird, but maybe it's a big cloak. You know, maybe this person doesn't want to, they want to spark something. They want to set off a big change, but they don't want to be the center of it. Yeah, I kind of like that. So this person's trying to sort of keep their identity from becoming the center of anything. So they wear this because it's not a, it's not a nun's habit. It's a big cloak. Uh, I man, as far as noses go, I have <laughs> no idea. Maybe we'll just try to we'll try to keep this looking like pretty vague. Yeah, that looks like big and cloaky. Let's say less. Is there a more nondescript nose? This one's pretty nondescript. Okay, and then we need a kind of a nondescript. Ooh, citizen. I like I like something that doesn't place the character above other people. So citizen's not bad. Certainly not my lord. Yeah, I think we're going to go with Citizen. Ooh, maybe Comrade. Citizen does also speak a little bit of, like, adherence to the law, I think. Which is, obviously, less our character. Reverend, madam. No, you know what? We'll do Citizen. It'll just be, um... It's just be one of those things people are going to have to understand. No, I don't mean like I'm a citizen of London. I mean like I'm a citizen of the sky. But random, randomizing the name also changes the term of address. Citizen Senior will fix it afterward. Uh, What's like a really... Oh, actually, I like that a lot. Citizen Shore. It's good. It's nondescript. It doesn't suggest very much about the character. I like that. This character is kind of a cipher intentionally. It's a crafted mystery. Okay, I think for the moment, this is who we are. And then we have to choose some facets, which uh, we started at level 14 here. So, obviously we have a lot of these. A quester in your lineage. One of your predecessors vanished while searching for the Martyr King's Cup. Everyone assumed they'd failed, but one day an extravagant cup appears on your doorstep. The cup is chiseled from weighty stone, engraved with intricate symbols that burn in the mind. It doesn't grant immortal life, but it makes an excellent conversation piece. Who do you think sent it to you? So, the cup has been drunk from already, right? The golden day is gone. Sister Patel no longer needs the cup, and I think she might want to try to, like, sort of disappear and re-emerge with a new identity, because she definitely was mixed up with some people who she maybe wouldn't want uh, calling on her powers of immortality. Who do you think sent it to you? Your immortal predecessor. They took the cup's power and gained life eternal. Now they travel the skies, keeping a friendly eye on their heir from afar. I think this, like, very much describes that relationship. So we'll gain a cryptic benefactor. Sister Patel is not interested in the struggle anymore, at least not right now. She wants to go out and just be powerful, just be in control of things. But she would be paying attention. She probably has a soft spot for this particular crewman. Uh, and then, of course, you are never without your copy of the Song of the Sky. It gives you purpose. It gives you solace. I don't know. I was... Uh, 
On our last character, on Sister Patel, I was a little reluctant to take these ones that reduce nightmares, because I was like, well, what if we need them later? But honestly, we know pretty good ways of controlling our terror, and if we did get uh, terrified into having a bunch of nightmares, I know how to clear them up at Magdalene's. I don't think it's a big deal to waste this. I think this is a cur this is a fine story beat for our character, and these are stats that we care about. Let's do this. The pages of your own copy are well thumbed and its spine is comfortably cracked. It might even be Sister Patel's old copy, although I'm sure she has a new one, if she gave it away. When you set it down, it falls open at the passage you've read a hundred times. You pull up your chair and make it a hundred and one. This character is considerably more idealistic than the last two were. Uh, I think that probably Sister Patel would not tell people that, like, she personally knew the Archivist, or that the train used to be his, because their relationship is kind of weird and strained. Um, uh, I definitely think she would go and visit him from time to time. Uh, I think she'd be overjoyed to be able to tell him that she succeeded where he failed, when he had it all, all that knowledge, all that opportunity in the palm of his hand, and he threw it all away, she, instead, closed her fist. Uh, we do have esteemed predecessors, there's no doubt about that. Uh, this is unlocked because another captain preceded you. This gives iron. Like, my, my primary concern right now is pushing hearts upward, because that weapon, uh, that, that weapon that is sort of representative of everything badass about Sister Patel, uh, is very hearts heavy to actually equip. And there's, you know, there's good, um, in addition to a good mechanical reason to equip it, there's a good sort of, uh, storyline there that it's a, it's the most powerful remnant of her, it's the thing that she left behind that keeps us safe, right? Family footsteps. The apple did not fall far from the tree. The way you turned out came as little surprise to those around you. Cast from a mold, they said. But which of your family's qualities do you embody? Some inherit wealth, you inherited character. Uh, maybe this character has, like, um, perhaps not revolutionary, but good, decent parents, and they inherited, you know, some good character from them. I kind of like that. We can fill that idea out a little bit more later. Say so we inherited our parents' virtues. I'm looking for, I need, I want things that have hearts as their major stat. You were the gossip of London salons and the target of blistering editorials in the Gazette. So it's possible that this person signed on with a train crew for some of the same reasons that um, that the archivist originally did before he was a captain, right? Trying to get away from something. What was the incident that exposed you to the buffeting winds of public opinion? I kind of like the idea of maybe... And maybe part of this character trying to keep their identity quiet is that they were associated with somebody famous or somebody rich or somebody powerful in a way that is pretty negative and maybe it's maybe it's for the best nobody knows our new character's name or where they are citizen shore's name or uh, or location shore is like definitely a fake name right this is an assumed name uh uh you know a lost love that makes sense the gradual erosion of that which separates you from someone else. The fitting together of two lives as intricately and intimately as the threads in a tapestry or the cells in your skin. You loved, you lost. How badly does it hurt now? Oh, this one gets, this one starts you with a moment of inspiration, too. <laughs> this is definitely valuable. Yeah, a gnawing ache, a hole in the heart. Like I said, an artistic temperament. They maybe didn't, uh, Citizen Shore, maybe didn't take the breakup so well. I wonder if it was maybe like um, a famous or powerful person who was married, or maybe, you know, at least arranged sort of to be married, and Citizen Shore was the side piece. And then, you know, for the sake of my public image, obviously I have to, you know, I have a thing going on here. You're going to have to disappear. And so we did. But we're not over it. We're like extremely not over it. It really sucks. Okay, what else has hearts as a lead? Haunted. You are plagued by the past. Some guilt or sin or old ordeal that will not let you rest. I mean, who isn't? What is the nature of the haunting? Although this is a little bit more literal haunting than a lot of people have to deal with. Right now, we are showing... 
pretty low mirrors. So maybe we're maybe we're haunted by an actual ghostly presence. A chill on the window, a breeze when the window is closed, a pressure on the edge of the bed as if someone was sat there as you slept. You are not alone. Maybe there's a little bit, uh, you know, this character's past is a little bit more complicated. So we have to end up with 70 hearts. Uh, or 75, I think, in order to wield that weapon. It doesn't all have to come right now. Uh, we do have some more level ups to gain, and of course we have to put our crew back together, and then, you know, um, their stats obviously will help a lot. So we have to... we have to get close, but we don't have to get all the way there, and I would like to bring our mirrors up a little bit as well. Like, if this character is seeking the truth, the ability to uh, know what the truth is probably matters quite a bit. Pestilence. Oh, the turning into glass thing. That seems like a bad idea. It seems like a bad thing to be partially made of glass. Oh, wow. Your breast has become translucent and allows an educational, if distressing, view of your coursing veins and thumping heart. You take pains to conceal it. I really, really love that metaphor. Like, that, that thing being literal about our character and what that means metaphorically about them. The progress of the disease has halted for now, but it has taken root beside our heart. And I, I love the fact that that dovetails in so nicely with, like, the heart of glass idea that we've already had, and also maybe why our character is a little bit less uh, rough and tumble than the last two, because of a fear of being literally cracked or shattered by physical violence. Alright, our esteemed predecessor... We could get a point of mirrors here, and a little bit of affiliation is a powerful thing. We might actually even want to hold off on this until we know whether we want one of these affiliations more than the other. So that might be something to take later. Uh, stuff that gives both mirrors and hearts is actually not all that common. For a time you lived the hand-to-mouth existence of a homesteader, carving a home on the frontier of the Reach. A hard scrabble existence scratched from the sky a month at a time. The Reach is verdant, but its homesteads cling to tiny exposed sky rocks. Most fail. In the end, what drove you back to the skies? Yeah, I like this. Okay, so maybe, like, the relationship with the rich and powerful whoever went wrong, and the person maybe, like, gave them a little go-away money, and they and Citizen Shore decided, okay, well, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to go, I'm going to strike out on my own. I'll be by myself, and I'll be fine. Except, it turns out that it's kind of hard, actually. A lot harder than they expected. Uh, let's see. What else gives bo both mirrors and hearts? It's actually pretty uncommon. Yeah, okay, we have five more to take. What else makes sense? The belt holes, you have foreseen your own death. I feel like we've, uh, we've taken this one three times over the past two characters, but I suppose there are not that many options, really. Uh, perhaps you saw it in a dream, perhaps a medium read it on your on your palm or in your tea leaves. I think if this character have foreseen their own death, it's probably in the skies, doing something revolutionary, leading the rebellion, or perhaps failing. Attempting and failing, and that is why it is so important that we elude it. Yeah, I'll take that. So we're at 51 hearts. I'd love to get to 55. Because that way, we, if we could just pick up a couple of the right companions, we could, uh, we could get up to 75 pretty quickly. We definitely will not be able to use the weapon right away. <laughs> we could also be personally uh, familiar with the Blind Bruiser. That dude gets around. It does say a blind bruiser, not the blind bruiser on the mentor thing there, but... Uh, the smoggy streets. You spent much of your youth in the hard end of London, where the gas lamps are scarce, the prospects bleak, and the people as flinty as the cobbles. Uh, it has definitely been the case that both of our other characters kind of came from a rough background. I guess the archivist came from a rich family. He just sort of got kicked out. There are definitely going to be a bunch of basic story beats that are similar between the three of them, and that's sort of like the thread uniting their purpose. Yeah, as soon as you saw an opportunity to make a new life for yourself, you jumped at it, and you haven't looked back. 
I wonder about this. This does sort of cast... It does sort of cast, like, the potential relationship with the powerful and rich person as maybe uh, a means of escape that makes their... Um, it makes Citizen Shore's motivation a little bit more mercenary, maybe, than I like. But maybe, maybe this refers to something else, and then the relationship came later, after we had sort of inserted ourselves into society somehow. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Three more. Uh, probably this character has not been to prison, or the sanitarium. The Call of the Sea. Oh yeah, the Mist Sea surrounding Whirlberry contains many secrets. One has touched you, or someone near to you who passed it on. There's a slight plasticity to your flesh. Maybe this person has a connection to Whirlberry that is unrelated to the Archivist. I kind of dig that idea. There are dreams, too, of unearthly choirs and a purple-black sky propped with pillars of lightning. What do you do when the dreams come? I think we revel in them. In those moments when the tireless storms sing, you feel you are home. You wake weeping, your tears as silver as mercury where they slide from your eyes and from the hidden ducts on the palm of your hand. This character's got some uh, physical problems, but I like this because I actually do want to... I want to try uh, mingling with the choirs enough and then uh, doing that event in Whirlberry that the Archivist did and this time getting the other the other outcome. Uh, and I know that was frustratingly vague, the way I phrased that. It is not because I was trying to be vague, it's because I can't remember <laughs> exactly what happened. Uh, I will go back and watch that part of that episode and figure out what level of commingling with the choirs we needed. We're, we are going to see the other outcome of that event. The Liberation of Night. You began to hear of a secret sect or philosophy among the most extreme anarchist cells. The Liberation of Night. The Liberation advocated revolt not only on Earth but in Heaven. It claimed light was law and that we would only be free in the dark. When a masked fanatic tried to convert you, how did you respond? This is interesting. So we don't like we don't have to keep our iron at 10. I, I, this would be okay to pick. I think the idea of the Liberation of Night, my guess is that the, the Liberation of Night is going to be important to our overall ambition. I don't know exactly in what way. I don't know whether we're going to be working sort of alongside them or against them. But my guess is they'll be important. So we should have had an encounter with somebody who told them about us. No one will be free until the stars are shaken from their thrones. Existence itself is a chain. Or his words smacked of religion. Which, as the very Reverend Kingsley said, is too often an opium dose for keeping beasts of burden patient while they are being overloaded. I think maybe uh, maybe Citizen Shore sent the dude packing, and then later, at night, was found, found himself unable to shake the idea. So this is part of, maybe this is like the moment when we decided we had to know the truth. Plus, moments of inspiration are definitely valuable. I would say that it is definitely better to have a moment of inspiration than it is to have a cryptic benefactor. Even if you, the things you get from having a cryptic benefactor are usually a little better. You just need moments of inspiration way more frequently. You could no longer be the person you were told to be. Your old life would have ground you beneath it. You had to change. Is this... I don't know if this fits for us. I'm just kind of clicking on anything that has a point of hearts available now. A disgraced predecessor? An earlier captain in your lineage is the subject of ridicule and rebuke. Hmm. I wonder. Tarred with your predecessor's brush, many doors were closed to you. Where did you turn to find acceptance? Okay, so maybe si Sister Patel definitely made some enemies, right? She burned down that big, um, <laughs> she burned down the sacred coffee plant in Atlas. She made enemies, she blew stuff up. So maybe the fact that this is, like, recognizably her engine it does cause us some problems. And we turned to Romantics to find acceptance. I think that fits with our character's whole deal. So High Hearts, High Veils, Decent Mirrors. Th this we'll definitely want to bring up some. And Pretty Poor Iron. I think this is about where I wanted this character to end up. We are definitely still Short Hearts, 
and we are not going to be able to equip all of our train parts. In particular, we're like really far away from the Ratronaut. Uh, things are going to be a little bit different here as we start to get back up to speed. No sooner have you pulled into the sidings than a long-faced man in a battered coat... Oh, this guy is trying to... This is a story was unlocked because you have Veils of Forty. This guy's trying to hook us up with the, uh, the contraband thing. Okay, an offer of work. We know all about that. Oh, hey, recruit. <laughs> in quotation marks, your aunt. Yeah, she seems like she would be very, very valuable. Oh, except we need a savage secret. We really really are short on stuff. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna pause the recording here. I'm gonna try to get us set up and figure out where we need to go next, and I'll be right back. Alright, and we're back. I've done a little bit of flying around. You might notice we're in New Winchester now instead of London. It started our character in London, which is inconvenient because this is actually where our ambition begins. Uh, I managed to pick up some crew, Flew around uh, the Reach, got us some basics, you know, some money and secrets and uh, visions of the heavens and whatnot. Just did the old Isambard line tour. Uh, so we've picked up crew, we've picked up some crew, and we do have enough people on board to fill all of our officer posts. But unfortunately, none of our crew will leave the engine room under any circumstances. So we're going to have to quest for these a little bit. But... I think we're ready to actually get started here. So, oh, one more thing I do I should talk about. Uh, this is the state of the engine right now. You might notice uh, that we have a diffident, <laughs> we're using our diffident bat again. We don't have the mirrors for even the cavi. It's a problem that could be resolved if we found an officer who gives mirrors. So hopefully that'll happen soon. For now, the bat, it's, it's fine, whatever. We don't really need a scout at this point anyway. Um, we just don't have enough objects. We, we don't have enough ship parts to fill all our slots. It turns out we were using uh, a lot of stuff that requires 50 iron. Uh, and I have equipped the Tears of Astolat weapon. Not because I think this is better than the rocket we were using, but because we hadn't gotten to use it yet. It's fine. It's a machine gun. And you just hold down the button and it fires. It is pretty cool. Uh, that you can, if you can, uh, it knocks people back quite a bit when you hit them with it, which interferes with being able to continue shooting them. But if you can pin something against a wall, you can just hold the button down until it no longer exists. And that is pretty cool. It's, it's effective for sure. Also, uh, <laughs> the emanation in the other slot, for real, our stats are terrible right now. We're working on it though. This is how we do it. Let's, uh, return to New Winchester and meet up with an old friend. She is an earnest agitator. You were firebrands together. You kept one another's secrets, even in dank brick cellars where special constables bloodied their knuckles on your ribs and jaws. Oh yeah, you know what, maybe there is, uh, maybe there is a good excuse for this character to have spent some time imprisoned. In time, you learned to temper your fires with guile. You were in this for the long haul. When London relocated, you went with it and resumed your activism in the heavens. Your friend somehow acquired a locomotive, the Azazel. Perhaps it was a gift from her patrons. Perhaps, as some said, she was the black sheep of a wealthy old blood family. She took her cause to the far corners of the sky. She is still captain of the Azazel and associates with a group of seasoned captains who gather at the Promise of Days here in New Winchester. Perhaps you can find her there. Oh, wow, I haven't thought about the promise of days in uh, quite a while. Alright, I know the Ernest Agitator is here somewhere. We suspect the Ernest Agitator is here somewhere, I should say. Ah, she speaks of you often, the plucky Baroness says. I'm afraid you've missed her. We've all been missing her recently. Busy girl, but she's doing important work in London. The bedeviled Didact frowns darkly and fingers one of his amulets. We've been assisting in our own small ways, but, well, she'll want to explain herself. She left a letter for you. Meg pulls a crumpled envelope from the, packet, the pocket of her patched coat. I'd open it somewhere. Private? Or someone, she glares at the masked citizen, will try to read over your shoulder. The masked citizen nods unapologetically. It's true, I'm a disgrace. Okay, yeah, we're just gonna see ourselves out then. Uh, 
Yes, I do not need to know how to make a fortune through trade. We are well beyond making a fortune. Privately, you examine the letter. The earnest agitator's handwriting, never neat, is clearly hurried. There are several unfinished trains of thought angrily struck through. She writes, coyly, of having embarked on a journey of the most fundamental discovery, and uh, of having uncovered celestial secrets. She says she wants to discuss her progress with you, but does not say where or when. The envelope also contains a collection of unfinished crosswords cut from the newspapers. Aw, oh, man. They're gonna... So obviously our character's gonna solve this stuff and we're gonna use in-game resources, but I sort of wish they would just provide me with the puzzle here. I would love to decode this. She always hated crosswords, and the phrasing of the letter is stilted, as if she had to use certain words in certain places. There is a concealed message here, you are certain, and the crosswords are the key. Okay, spending half of our supply of secrets already. Eureka! Late nights, a score of failed attempts, bunched up and thrown into the fire. But at last, you are successful. The pages concealed not one hidden message, but two, each complicating and confounding the other. The first is an exhortation to meet at the same place and under the same circumstances that you last parted. That was in London, during the annual Jubilation Day festivities that commemorate the Empire's conquest of a son, which, as we know, didn't actually happen, or at least... If it did happen, happened in a rather more complicated way than people think. The second is a sequence of letters picked from the crosswords, which alone took entire nights to complete. You scribble them down on the back of the envelope. The stars are dying. Huh. Well, I mean, we do know of a few stars that have died. I wonder if this means, like, you know, they're getting old or they're something is hunting and killing them. I suppose we'll just have to go to London to find out. But fortunately, London is right next door. It takes no time at all to travel there. And apparently, today is Jubilation Day. Wow, what luck! During Jubilation Day, London celebrates its conquest of the sun that once ruled Albion. And uh, now that we've got our aunt on back on board, she probably has some thoughts about this whole thing. During Jubilation Day... Hey, I read that sentence already. Clergy of the new sequence, backed by exultant choirs, preach from every balcony exhorting the light and order of the man-made clockwork sun, which has never been terribly healthy in our game. Banners flutter from state buildings. Hosannas are sung to the queen. Fireworks crack in the sky, dying in brief blazes. The last time you saw the earnest agitator, you attended the festivities together. Uh, well, <laughs> we could, of course, purchase a bag of rubbery lumps, and when wouldn't you do such a thing? Apparently it is not yet time to meet up with our friend. I guess let's watch the burning of a gilded effigy. Is this an effigy that is supposed to represent the sun that died? In Hyde Park, where avenues are lined with bronzewood saplings broad as old oaks, crowds have gathered. Flames lick at the King of Hours' shins. His guilt peels and blackens. When the fire reaches his waist and one arm cracks and falls into the conflagration, the crowd cheers. When you were here with the earnest agitator, she seemed distracted. Once, you caught her watching you, the firelight gold on her face. When you asked her what the matter was, she said nothing, and turned away. Hmm, that is curious. Well, I suppose, let's just buy a bag of these things. I really, I don't know that I can bring myself to eat them at this point. They don't taste like they did back when London lay in its gloomy cavern below the earth. Presumably, one can't get the lumps, but lump substitutes have been invented. It is best not to speculate upon what hides within their crunchy batter. You have been chewing this one for some time, for example, and the less you know, the better. When you were here with the earnest agitator, she bought one bag of lumps for you and two for herself. She considered herself a connoisseur. Okay, now, now that we have done both of those things, soon the clocks will chime eleven, the hour you parted. The two of you had walked to the edge of Southwark Isle, in order to escape the crowds. London sprawls across plates of skyrock connected with bridges, funiculars, stairs, and, in less salubrious cases, ladders. Southwark is one of the higher plates. A simple railing discourages you from its edge. The clockwork sun is behind you, dimmed for the night. 
Stretching before you are darker skies, studded with far, fierce stars. Below, where the lower, poorer districts are caked in smog, the sounds of raucous celebrations continue. The clocks begin to chime, and your friend is not here. You find a bench and wait. Fireworks flare and whistle. The clocks strike twelve at precisely the same second. The horological office keeps them to perfect time. Still, there's no sign of your friend. And the clocks chime one. She is not coming. Well, hopefully that's because she decided that whatever it was that was going to happen here didn't need to happen, and not because she's been, like, apprehended by the Ministry of Public Decency or anything. Suppose we'll have to track her down. Uh, well, we could ask our contacts at the Ministry if we were the sort of people who were given to having contacts at the Ministry. We'll just chat with some mutual acquaintances. You need to reacquaint yourself with a number of people you have also lost contact with. Fortunately, we have exactly enough gossip to get that job done. You focus your efforts on the dark factories where, when the last shift had ended, revolutionaries gathered to enact the schemes of their calendar council. No one has seen your friend in some time, and not at all since the fire. The fire? Apparently, there was a fire in the building where she rented rooms. No bodies were found, but she hasn't been seen since. You are able to secure the address. Okay, well let's look into that. The building your friend lived in was a narrow lodging house, divided into too many apartments. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Now it is a blackened husk, still standing only because it's wedged between houses on either side. The constabulary have boarded it up. A pair of homeless gentlemen occupying the opposite doorway are happy to tell you about it. Oh, we saw it. They said it was a gas fire. Burned blue, didn't it, George? Ah, says George. Blue. He just, he just says R. He's a pirate, but he's like only a little bit of a pirate. Okay, well, let's just break in there, I guess. Prying aside the boards, you enter. The fire stink claws at your throat. Thin stairs, warped and blackened, lead upwards. But when you set foot on the first step, it collapses. You are forced to inch up, testing each one as you go. The roof has collapsed, exposing the garret to the air. Blackened beams jut like ribs from a slew of tumbled tiles. Search the ruin, but carefully. The building's shell groans in the slightest wind. This does seem very unsafe to me. You unearth a few burned pages from the rubble. None are untouched by the fire, and many are blotted by rain, but you manage to pick out a handful of gnomic phrases. Constellations and conjunctions. Chrysanthemum, amaranthine, nepenthine. Liberation? Meg, the fire that follows, equals the courtesies, I'm assuming, bloodhound. King of Hours, Green Regent, consult the rolls of ash. This latter one has the bedeviled Didax name written at the top. If Meg is Spatchcocker Meg, that's two of your acquaintances from the Promise of Days named in these papers. Is this the important work they were helping the earnest agitator with? It's time they talk to you. Oh yeah, should I just fly back to New Winchester then? This quest has been very inconvenient so far. You know, I'd be lying if I said that that trip was not starting to get a little tiny bit tiresome. So how many clicks do you think it's going to be here before they send us back to London? The seasoned captains, the plucky baroness, the bedeviled didact, the masked citizen, and spatchcocker Meg have been assisting the earnest agitator with her investigations into the fate of the stars. At least, that's our read on what's currently happening. So maybe they will know something that they didn't tell us before? If they had information, why would they have withheld it? Maybe they needed to know that we could complete the crosswords first. But your friend has disappeared, and a mysterious fire claimed her lodgings and research. Your attempt to find her has reached a dead end. By continuing her research, you might learn what happened. So let's just uh, inform them. Hey, I'm stepping in on whatever kind of secret business you guys were up to. No need to check my references or anything. Their faces darken as you recount your experiences in London. Intolerable, the masked citizen says, knuckles white around the stem of their glass. Of course we'll help, Meg grunts. The didact leans forward, his narrow face grim. Understand that each of us only has a piece of the puzzle. Our mutual friend insisted upon it. Only she would have the whole. Well, she and now you. 
Indeed, we've each been pursuing a different strand of investigation, says the Baroness. Now we'll share them with you. Perhaps you can help us pursue them. Okay, so we're gonna get a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of threads to follow here. Well, we gotta start somewhere. Research into the politics of suns, the fire that follows. That seems familiar. Have we seen that somewhere before? An examination into how suns die, uh, which we know uh, we know kind of something about. Or the citizens' investigation into the courtesy. I'm curious about the fire that follows. Let's start there. This phrase was mentioned in the notes you retrieved from your friend's lodgings. I'm pretty sure it's a monster, Meg says, wiping her nose on her sleeve. A fire that's a monster. You know, that uh, that doesn't really sound that crazy to me. Did some asking around. If you want to know about a monster, ask another monster. That's what I've been doing. I've been told it's a living flame, and it burns blue. Sound familiar? You remember the description of the mysterious fire that consumed your friend's lodgings. Yeah, our friend was afraid of the fire. She was always a clever girl. Anyway, next on my list for a chat is Mr. Menagerie. He's harmless enough for a bat-faced aberration, but he don't talk for cheap. Four caged catches should help replenish his stock. Let me know when you're ready to go. Well, fortunately, Mr. Menagerie is still permanently planted here in New Winchester, so that'll be easy enough to move forward. Uh, what about the Didax research into the politics of suns? As we know, the suns, or more properly, judgments, are the regents and legislature of the heavens. They establish the natural laws that govern existence. With the, with the assistance of our friend and the Royal Society's admirable t t telescope, I've been able to formulate some initial ob observations. Firstly, that the stars d demonstrate social groupings. These have been classified into constellations and conjunctions. Constellations are small and local, comparable perhaps to kin groups or clans. A son's extended family, if you will. Conjunctions are rather grander. There are only a handful of them, perhaps three or four. It's possible they're con con confederacies or nations. Let's say more, I need more data. Observations on and relics of the heavens. Okay, I think we have two uh, otherworldly artifacts and two visions of the heavens. Oh, in fact, <laughs> there is just nothing you can do. I'm pretty sure we started this character with no artifacts. There is nothing you can do to just not accumulate these things constantly. All right, well, we have those for you right now. You visit his tiny corner office at the university, piled with books and grotesque curios. Pushing a stack of work off the desk, he turns immediately to your materials. You leave him to it. A week later, he calls you back to discuss his findings. He serves you black, sweet tea, the cup and saucer rattling in his shaking hand. All st study of the suns is difficult. The judgments are vast, ancient, beings of incomprehensible complexity. Any investigation is also an act of tr translation, rendering their concerns and structures into analogies we can comprehend. Nevertheless, I b believe I better understand the conjunctions that divide them now. Imagine vast nations, but f founded upon philosophy, not geography. There are th three primary... C c c c c c okay, we'll just help him out a little bit here. Conjunctions, you're going to say conjunctions. He shoots you an irritated look and presses on. The chrysanthemum conjunction are concerned with inception, with beginnings and newness, while their counterparts, the amaranthine conjunction, believe in culmination, bringing things to completion. The nepenthine conjunction advocate separation, distinction, isolation, the raising of barriers and the drawing of borders. He frowns. They do not get on. Okay, I think we've heard of... We've definitely heard these terms before. We've been getting little tiny pieces of this story the whole time. I must consult a primary source, the Roll of Ash. I believe it will shed light on the friction between the conjunctions. There's a library in the Blue Kingdom, at the Forge of Souls. Okay, I can take you there. I've been there before, we know what the deal is there. He begins to pack his things, mostly books and a jangling collection of amulets and talismans he retrieves from his shelves. I am unsure exactly what the Roll of Ash is or contains. I know that it is the work of the Courtesy, 
a topic which our masked friend is looking into. Some of our strands are beginning to, to tie together. Currently, the role is in the keeping of someone called the Lamentation of Mists. I do wonder... Like, how much visibility did the crew have, exactly, to all of the stuff that Sister Patel saw in the ports? You know, does she, does she roll deep everywhere, or was she doing a lot of that stuff herself for fear that someone would try to overtake the quest? Basically, I'm wondering if Citizen Shore has ever had occasion to know anything about the Lamentation of Mists. He boards your engine gingerly. I have curtailed my t travel lately, he says, peering suspiciously at the stars. Increasingly, I believe some things are best left undiscovered. Yeah, I am uh, <laughs> sensitive to that idea, at least. Okay, so we can only do one Caption's actual travel mission at a time. Well, we can at least start talking about the others. So the Baroness is examining how suns die. She arranges you to meet you. At, uh, she arranges to meet you at her family home, an elegant townhouse on the edge of New Winchester. Tea, port, and an array of biscuits await you in her drawing room. The Baroness helps herself to all three. Let me bring you up to speed. I've been looking into what it would take to kill a son. We know two local sons have died: that of Albion and that of the Reach. Our dear Ernest Agitator and I were preparing an autopsy. She'd acquired a sample of, what would be the term, post-necrotic celestial tissue? Sun's blood? Anyway, a sample of that from the remains of Albion's son. That leaves the reach. She offers you a plate. More biscuits? Uh, okay. The biscuits do make a change from the awful fungal crackers you have to eat aboard your locomotive. You know, we have so much money, you'd think we'd be able to lay out for some decent rations at this point. Hmm, they're good, aren't they? As I was saying, I've ordered some specialized equipment from Portsmouth House. Unfortunately, they've run into some complications during development. I've put together some material that should help unstick them. She indicates a trunk of papers and components. But I imagine they'll need more if they're to complete it soon enough. Perhaps you could help. Okay, travel to the Royal Society, do a thing. I can do that. And what about the masked citizen and his adorable eye-patched rat? And the courtesy. The citizen is already immersed in an investigation. Unfortunately, I haven't got very far, they confess. Is it a person? An organization? A process? My usual sources are ignorant or reticent, which is itself informative, of course. I suspect that the courtesy is not merely little known, but actively concealed. A conspiracy. Alright, then what is the next step? We should try our luck at Pan. It is a place where many secrets come to roost, and people there are willing to discuss topics others fear to. Let me know when you're ready to depart. Okay, I'm really glad that we did not start this ambition ir immediately after completing the fame ambition, because I wouldn't have had any idea how to go about some of this stuff. Alas, this mystery is not the only demand upon our time. You know, we have a train to run and everything. Okay, Mr. Menagerie, hold on. First, let's pull four caged catches out of our bank here. Uh, I do not wish to purchase a bat or... Huh. Can we not interact with Mr. Menagerie directly? Do we have to do so, like, through that that particular quest interface? Select Meg from New Winchester. I, uh, I took the Didact on board, so we can't do this other thing. That's kind of wild, considering that we don't actually have to leave the port. We can just walk down the street. But okay, I guess that's how that's going to work. So, back to the Blue Kingdom with us, but uh, I know this episode probably is going to end up a little bit short. I have spent quite a bit of time flying back and forth, and sadly, I am out of recording time for the moment. So that's going to have to be it for us for today. Thank you all so much for watching, and come back next time when we begin our investigation in earnest. And we'll see you then.